Hello! Welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is a review of cells. So, one of the things that we also need to be aware of is that the body is full of muscles and bones and your big job in the first semester is to memorize the muscles and bones. You don't have to memorize every muscle and bone but you do have to memorize everything that's listed in your lab guide. So to make sure that you are working on memorizing your muscles and bones as we go throughout the semester, we're going to do a bone of the day. Not a bone of the day today, but we'll do a muscle of the day. Every other day we're going to do a bone of the day and a muscle of the day so that when you start class, you're beginning your memorization and when we get to the end of the semester and go over these systems, you'll have a lot of this stuff already memorized. So what I want you to do <laughs> for our muscles of the day is actually close your eyes and we're going to do a muscle meditation. And so again, tomorrow we'll do a bone of the day and a muscle of the day and a muscle meditation. But today we're just going to do a muscle meditation. And so for our me meditations, what we'll do is most days we'll breathe in the name of the muscle and then breathe out the action. But today we're going to talk about the muscle, the primary muscle of respiration, the respiratory diaphragm. And so we're going to go backwards. We're actually going to breathe in its action because it flattens during inspiration and we'll breathe out the name. And we're going to do this for seven breaths. So in class, I would be looking at your face and making sure that all your eyes were closed. I can't do this while you're sitting at home, but I'd ask you, to close your eyes and just relax and work with me to do these muscle meditations. It'll help like just get the day started off right, thinking about anatomy and physiology, but from a calm place. So when your respiratory diaphragm contracts, it's going to push down on your abdominal organs and increase the volume in your thorax. So your respiratory diaphragm is actually this really large muscle that sits right here between your uh, thoracic cavity and your abdominal pelvic cavity. And so when it pushes down, it increases the volume in here so that we get a drop in pressure and air will flow from the atmosphere into your respiratory uh, system. So that's its action. It flattens during inspiration and it's called the respiratory diaphragm. So here we go, close your eyes and we're going to breathe in, flattens during inspiration and breathe out, respiratory diaphragm and breathe in, flattens during inspiration and breathe out, respiratory diaphragm and breathe in, flattens during inspiration and breathe out, respiratory diaphragm and breathe in, flattens during inspiration. And breathe out, respiratory diaphragm. And breathe in, flattens during inspiration. And breathe out, respiratory diaphragm. And breathe in, flattens during inspiration. And breathe out, respiratory diaphragm. And breathe in, flattens during inspiration and breathe out, respiratory diaphragm. And breathe in, and breathe out, and come back to class. So let's just go ahead and talk about cells. Cells are the smallest unit that display all of the living characteristics that, require, that are required for things to be classified as alive. They maintain boundaries, they metabolize, they excrete, they do stuff. So cells, these are the smallest living units and they're going to come together to make up tissues. Tissues are going to be really, really important. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about tissues in our next couple lectures. So it's important to be aware of what cells are doing so that when we go to the tissues and look at the cells that are present in them, we can see what those cells are doing for the tissue and how it's giving each particular tissue the special characteristics that that tissue has. So cells, the smallest living units, uh, they are incredibly diverse. So we have cells that connect things. All of our connective tissues have cells that are connecting things to each other. We have cells that line things like your organs. <laughs> and we have cells that transport things like your red blood cells, which transport your respiratory gases. So we also have cells that store stuff, 
Like what? Well, there are these cells called adipocytes that store a large droplet of fat, and that can be used as a fuel store, so we can store energy. We have cells that move stuff, so skeletal muscle cells contract and move bone. Smooth muscle cells contract and move stuff in hollow organs. We have cells that fight disease, so we'll talk next semester about the immune system and all of our immune cells that are gonna help keep us uh, healthy. We also have cells that gather information and communicate. Some of my favorite cells in the body, neurons, so pretty cool. We have cells that carry on genetic information, so sperm have little flagella they can move, and then our oocytes carry our genetic information. So cells are really, really important. And somewhere in your book, you've got a picture of the cell. And <clears throat> it's a general schematic of a cell. And it's got all of our important uh, organelles, like a nucleus. The nucleus is the brain of the cell. What does that mean? Well, it's got all of the instructions for what the cell is going to do. And that's contained in the DNA, which is found as chromatin most of the time. This stuff just like spread out through the nucleus. Uh, when you're about to do cell division, it's going to condense and, and replicate and become this beautiful thing that we recognize when we're looking at chromosome maps. But uh, there's the nucleus in there. It's got that. Um, so you have to slip through a nuclear envelope to get in there. Um, I don't know, what are some other important organelles? Like your endoplasmic reticulum. You've got your rough endoplasmic reticulum and that is gonna be important for making proteins that are destined for export. You've got your smooth endoplasmic reticulum that is going to store things in the cell. Uh, what else do we have? We've got lysosomes that are full of digestive enzymes. We've got um, centrioles that are important in cell division. All cells also have mitochondria. This is the site of ATP production, so the powerhouse of the cell. So mitochondrion, uh, what else? I mean, you know, you've got, there, there, uh, you got cytoskeletal elements. You can look at the generalized schematic of the cell and review it. I would challenge you to see how much you recall about the cell. Because if you've made it to my class, you should have seen cells a few times in your life. And so I'm sure that you know what they, all of the things do. So maybe look at your picture of the cell, maybe see its name first and then see what, like ask yourself, do I know what this does just from looking at the figure? Uh, it's a good test of your recall and um, it'll give you a good review. So what are cells or organelles that we're gonna be concerned with? Well, mitochondria, skeletal muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria because uh, they are continuously active and they need a lot of ATP, so that's kind of a specialization. Uh, I don't know, we'll look at specialized organelles when we get to each particular cell type. Really what I wanna review about the cell is the plasma membrane stuff that proteins in the plasma membrane can do, and then kind of talk about cell transport. So as far as the cell goes, it maintains a boundary between itself and the external environment. So outside of itself, anything that's outside of the cell is an extracellular material. Anything inside the cell is an intracellular material, and it's all contained within the cytoplasm. So substances that are found outside cells are extracellular materials, and these can be things like extracellular fluids. Uh, or cellular secretions, or extracellular matrix. So what are these things that we're talking about? So extracellular fluids. Interstitial fluid is the most common uh, extracellular fluid. And I tend to abbreviate ECF and say interstitial fluid and be talking about the fluid that we find between the cells and most tissues of our body. So this is tissue fluid and it's between our cells. Okay, now blood plasma is a liquid tissue, so it's 
specialized extracellular matrix is liquid fluid blood plasma that holds all of the blood cells. So it's the extracellular fluid of the tissue blood. So this is just the ECF of blood and we'll say it contains cells and everything else in blood. <laughs> Okay, cerebrospinal fluid is the extracellular fluid in the nervous system. So the nervous system is protected by, by what's called a blood-brain barrier, and that helps to make sure that we can't just passively allow just anything willy-nilly-like into that really critical tissue. So cerebrospinal fluid is the specialized extracellular fluid of our nervous system or our nervous tissue. And we'll talk more about uh, these two in particular, when we get to blood as its own chapter next semester, and cerebrospinal fluid when we talk about the nervous system this semester. Cellular secretions are also extracellular fluid, so this could be things like um, sweat. Uh, so if you're a secreting cell in an exocrine gland and you produce sweat, that's going to be released outside you and be secreted into a duct that empties onto your surface. If you are an endocrine cell that is producing a hormone, you will produce that hormone and secrete it outside of you and then into the blood. We'll talk more about these at the end of, not this chapter, next chapter. Uh, extracellular matrix is another type of extracellular material that we find in connective tissues. And we're gonna talk a lot about connective tissues soon. So we'll talk about the specifics of extracellular matrix when we get to our connective tissues, which I'm going to abbreviate as CT. So, all right, extracellular materials, wrap our heads around that. The plasma membrane is this special barrier that is, that is able to keep this difference between the intracellular and extracellular environments. And it does that because it acts, of this, it, it acts as this selectively permeable barrier that is going to prevent just the passive passage of materials into and out of the cell. So it's an active barrier that separates our intracellular fluid from our extracellular fluid. It has this dynamic role in cellular activity by controlling what enters and what leaves the cell. What does this mean? A dynamic role. It's a changing role. So you may have heard the cell membrane described as a fluid mosaic. And what that means is that it's, it's like, it is wobbly and semi like fluid. It has fluidity to it because of those lipids in it, phospholipid bilayer. And this like mosaic piece means that you can like pull in and pull out. It's ever changing. And it gives it this dynamic ability to change <laughs> given what's going on in the body and control what's going on in its own environment by controlling what's entering it and leaving it. So we'll talk more about that later. So it's known as the cell membrane. Oh, what do we care about it? It contains, um, phos it's a phospholipid bilayer. So it's lipid um, permeable. And we can also find other lipids like, um, present in it, like there's cholesterol in the plasma membrane, and this is what helps to give it uh, that fluidity. So it gives fluidity. If you don't have cholesterol, plasma membranes get rigid, and that's never good. Okay, proteins are really what I wanna talk about. There are a lot of different types of proteins that we find in plasma membranes, and they do a lot of stuff for the cell. So proteins are a biological macromolecule, it's chains of amino acids that are folded up into alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, and then they glob together and you know, all that stuff. What we care about is what they're doing in the cell. So how do proteins function in the cell membrane and what are they gonna do for us? Well, they can help with transport, so bringing things into or out of the cell. So they can allow materials into or out of the cell. 
And so this could be carrier mediated, it could be uh, channel mediated. So um, yeah, it's gonna allow for transport proteins. So what are, what are those? Like they ch either change shape or they don't. <laughs> Uh, proteins in plasma membranes can also be receptors. This is going to be really important for us when we start talking about neurons and neurotransmitter receptors. And then again, when we talk about muscles and neurotransmitter receptors. So receptors are proteins in cells that are going to be able to bind to ligands and cause some kind of effect in the cell. So you'll see, you'll see a lot like receptor ligand or ligand complexes. And so what that is, is just this protein stuck in the plasma membrane that is going to be able to bind a really specific substrate and cause some change inside the cell. So, or it comes, have some kind of response. So receptors are receptive to a stimulus and are going to cause some kind of intracellular response. So receptors, we'll say bind ligands, ligands. <laughs> I usually call it ligands, but I just was listening to this audio book and this guy pronounced the Latin word ligier and so he called it a ligand. So I might need to change my pronunciation. Okay, so they bind ligands and cause a change in the cell, um, or we'll say cause a response in the cell. Proteins in the plasma membrane can also act as enzymes. What's an enzyme? What does it do? Speeds up chemical reactions, right? You'd say, well, an enzyme's a protein. You just told me that, lady. I know, but what's it do? It, it speeds up chemical reactions. So all of the biological reactions that are necessary to maintain life happen too slowly on their own to maintain life. So we stick in an enzyme, speed up the chemical reaction, and we can maintain this uh, living organism. So enzymes, proteins acting as enzymes will speed up chemical reactions. Ah, what else? Well, they can actually act as cell-to-cell -cell recognition molecules. So we have proteins that can mark cells as self, and this is how like your immune cells know that it's you versus somebody else, so like that. Cell adhesion molecules. Just, yeah, there's just lots of stuff we can find that for cells to communicate with each other, uh, little proteins in their plasma membrane that will allow for these cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So we'll just say this allows cells to be identified as self. Allow cells to be identified as self. And then the last major category, uh, oh, lies. It's just the last one that we can see on this line before the next one. Well, you can't even see it. So then we also have cells that adhere to the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. I'm not gonna really write anything down about it. It says everything you need to know. They adhere to the cytoskeleton uh, and the extracellular matrix. What does that mean? The cytoskeleton are all those proteins inside the cell that give the, pro the cells uh, itself structure. And so if you have some in the plasma membrane that are anchored, some proteins in the plasma membrane anchored to those cytoskeletal elements, then it helps to give the cell some of its structure and support. So you can also find proteins doing that in the plasma membrane. What I really care about, I mean, I care about all of it, but what I'm really gonna spend a lot of time talking about today, right now, as far as proteins go, are cell junctions. So I don't know if you can see past Alex. Alex is here because he's blocking the glaring light that is coming right at my face. So I know you may not like Alex, but he's actually serving a purpose. So pardon. Pardon that. I will try to be aware. I don't know if you can see past here. I guess I can see if you can see past here. You can. What that says behind there is cell junctions. It's coming right here. So let's talk about it. Cell junctions are proteins in the plasma membrane that are going to connect cells to each other so that in a tissue, say, we can behave as a cohesive like tissue fabric. 
So we can only do that if we hook our cells together. And we can do that using three types of cell junctions. So tight junctions have these junctional proteins that tightly seal plasma membranes together. So let's just imagine this is two cells that are going to be connected by tight junctions. Their junctional proteins really tightly seal their plasma membranes together and wind through so that you can't just passively allow materials to pass between those cells. So tight junctions uh, will say contain junctional proteins that um, tightly seal plasma membranes together. Where might we want this? The blood-brain barrier is one area where you don't just want the passive passage of materials into your brain and nervous tissue. Another place, actually, there's a blood testes barrier because the testes contain all the genetic information for males and it's continuously dividing. So it's really important to protect um, sperm from whatever's going on in the blood. So there's actually a blood testes barrier as well. So you find tight junctions there. You also find it in, say, like cells in your bladder where we want to be able to store urine. So tight junctions are going to be found linking up cells where we really want to control the movement of materials into and out of this tissue. So if something is going to get into or out of a tissue with tight junctions, it's got to do it through the cell. It can't do it between the cell. Okay, our second type of cell junction is a desmosome. And these are also physical junctions, but now these are more like snapping our cells together. So like, like right here we might have one, right here we might have one. And so some stuff can get through. It's not as great a seal as the tight junction is. So we could say this is a physical junction that it like, mm, I guess I should say that loosely connects plasma membranes. It's not professional to say snap, snaps it together. That's what happens though. <laughs> okay, so a clothing analogy for these two types of cell junctions would be like um, in your jeans, not your jeans, well probably your jeans, but all your pants, that bottom hem is really tightly sealed together really well, right? So that your it looks neat on the bottom and the fabric doesn't just fold everywhere. That's like a tight junction, is like a hem that really sews the pieces of fabric together. Desmosomes are like the buttons on your raincoat. So I can snap one here and snap one here and snap one here, but I can still stick my hand between those buttons. So that's kind of a good analogy. Uh, another thing, another like a place that we find desmosomes is in our skin, in the epidermis of our skin. And so it holds all of these cells together so that my epidermis, like these cells behave as a cohesive tissue fabric. Uh, but you've all sat in a bathtub for too long and absorbed a lot of water and become pruney. It's because the water can slip pretty easily between those desmosomes, especially the longer you're sitting in it. So. Um, that's our second type of physical junction. The last type of cell junction is an electrical junction or a chemical junction, I should say. Uh, and primarily, like if we're, what we're talking about is the movement of ions, then that's electricity. It's the movement of charge and it's going to conduct an electrical impulse in the body. We'll get there. Gap junctions create pores in plasma membranes that allow for the almost instantaneous movement of materials between cells. So if we were to look here, we would see that we have these little proteins that create these pores in the cell so that stuff, chemicals, can be transmitted um, from one cell to the next. So we'll sell, say these chemically, or pores, these are pores that chemically join cells. And so in your heart, you actually find these specialized junctions called intercalated discs that has both of these things. So that all of the cardiac muscle cells are attached physically and chemically. So that when one contracts, they all contract. And then because they're contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing, we want them to be physically united as well. So we'll get there. Those are cell junctions.
Okay, I really do not want to spend a lot of time talking about membrane transport. Other people who are biologists, I mean, I'm a biologist, but I'm a specialist. I'm a physiologist. And the biologists are getting paid to teach you things like membrane transport when you're talking about cells in gen bio. So you should have learned all about passive processes like diffusion and how it can be simple or facilitate it. You should have learned about osmosis. Then you should have learned about tonicity. So, okay, why am I bringing it up again? Because maybe you haven't taken gen bio in 10 years. And this is gonna be really important when we talk about membrane transport at all. When we, it's gonna be really important when we talk about the behavior of our neurons and the behavior of our muscle cells. We're gonna get into the really nitty gritty about the movement of ions in those cells. And so if you don't understand what diffusion is, when I say to you sodium diffuses down its concentration gradient, then you might not recognize that means sodium is gonna go from high concentration outside the cell to low concentration inside the cell. So we're gonna do a review, but it's gonna be quick. If it's too quick, just slow it down to like 75% and then it might make it easier. All right, so membrane transport. How are we getting things across the membrane into or out of the cell? Well, we can do it passively or we can do it actively. Passively means that we're going to require no ATP. It's just going to happen. So passive processes do not require ATP. And why not? They're using a concentration gradient. So they're using these wonderful laws of chemistry to move down a concentration gradient. So diffusion is when you move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So we move from high concentration to low concentration. Okay, if we look at the cell, sodium is higher outside, chloride ion is higher outside, potassium is higher inside. Those are going to be the ones that we really care the most about. Inside, to balance these positive charges and remain electrically neutral, we have these proteins that are kind of negatively charged and they can't leave the cell, but potassium can, which means that most of our cells are sitting here with a negative resting memory. They're all sitting in a negative resting memory potential. We'll get there in a minute. But Okay, so in simple diffusion, I would just diffuse from uh, one area to the other because my plasma membrane is permeable to that. So that's not what's going on with these guys. <laughs> uh, lipid soluble materials can simply diffuse. So in simple diffusion, um, you don't require any kind of protein or anything to facilitate your movement from high to low concentration. So simple diffusion. Things that move by simple diffusion are really small or lipid soluble. So like O2 and CO2 are really small, they can simply diffuse. Uh, but, um, and like alcohol is uh, lipid soluble, it can simply diffuse. Um, so just be aware of that. So for simple diffusion, we'll say small and lipid sol soluble materials move across the plasma membrane without any kind of protein. Okay, the other thing that we can do is we can stick a protein in the plasma membrane and facilitate diffusion. So what does that mean? Well, I can put a, plasma, a protein in the plasma membrane that allows something that's not lipid soluble or small to get through. So if I stick a sodium leak channel in here, then I'm just gonna let sodium leak down its concentration gradient passively into the cell. So I've, I will facilitate its diffusion by sticking a leak channel in. So what we can say here is that we have some either kind of carrier, which is going to be one that changes shape, or a channel, which is just open, or opens in response to some kind of stimulus. Those are going to be the proteins that are going to facilitate diffusion. So we could say proteins, and then I'll put in parentheses, carriers, or channels. 
allow for the diffusion of large, larger, or non-lipid soluble substances. And the last type of passive process we need to worry about is osmosis, and this is just the diffusion of water. What's diffusion? The movement from high concentration to low concentration. So osmosis is the movement of, of water from high water concentration to low water concentration. And what's weird about this is that it kind of works opposite of how you think it's going to work, and that's where tonicity comes into play. So osmosis is the diffusion of water and it's horribly important <laughs> so we will talk about like osmolarity and we'll see that sodium actually is the ion the most uh, is the most important for driving osmolarity or the movement of water water will follow sodium where it goes so we'll talk more about that um, as we move throughout but just be aware of that what is osmosis then actually like a better definition so osmosis is the diffusion of water or the movement of water from hypotonic to hypertonic Okay, what's that mean? Well, what is tonicity? Tonicity, it's how much stuff you have. So, like if you have salty water, it's hypertonic. If you have a cup of water and you dump in like four tablespoons of salt, then it's gonna get really salty really fast. That's hypertonic. Hyper, it has a lot in it. Hypotonic is less than, it doesn't have a lot of stuff in it. It's got a lot of water in it, but it doesn't have a lot of solute in it. So, yeah, that's that. Tonicity, what does tonicity mean? This is like the relative concentration of various substances. So when substances are isotonic, it means that they have the same amount of solutes um, on both sides of say a membrane or two, two different chemicals are isotonic if they have the same amount of solutes in their solvent. Water is the universal solvent so in our water. Okay that's what we care about. All right substances are hypertonic a hypertonic substance has more solutes in it than what we're comparing it to. Has more, or a lot, hyper, a lot, a lot, has more solutes and then in a hypotonic solution it has less solutes and so we would have more water up here we would have less water well, what does this mean water wants to go from hypotonic to hypertonic so the figure that you'll see a lot of times is this semi-permeable membrane here and we'll show you one that's permeable to both water and solute, one that's permeable to only water and what that is showing you is if water and if, if we have a membrane that's permeable to both water and solute they're both going to move both ways until we reach chemical equilibrium. Okay well what if this membrane is only permeable to water which means that only water can move through it so over here I've got a lot of water and not a lot of solute over here I've got a little water but I got a lot more solute. I'm hypertonic. I have more stuff. But this stuff can't come over here and reach chemical equilibrium. Water can come over here and try to reach water equilibrium and that's what it's going to do. We've got an osmotic pressure for water to move from hypotonic to hypertonic. So that's what we'll do. We would see that if we started and these columns of fluid were the same, that what would happen as water moves over here, this side is going to drop in volume 
and this side is going to increase as vo in volume as the water moves over, but the chemical, the um, solutes can't move over. All right, why do we care about that? Well, because we're gonna talk about the movement of fluids into and out of various tissues and organs in the body. Uh, so you have to just be aware of it. Put it in your back pocket for now. Hey. Okay, active transport requires ATP. And why is that? We're moving against a concentration gradient. So we could say active processes use ATP to transport a material against or up its concentration gradient. So since we're going against the concentration gradient, we're gonna require energy. Well, why would we do that? Well, because if we didn't do that, we would reach chemical equilibrium. So we have to do that. And in primary active transport, we're going to directly use ATP to move something against its chemical concentration gradient. And in secondary active transport, we're gonna use the concentration gradient that's set up in primary active transport to move something else against this concentration gradient. So I'm not gonna go over all of the nitty gritty details of these things. You can review it in your book and um, review it hopefully in your old notes you have from GenBio. But when we get to neurons, and I talk to you about the sodium potassium pump, you're going to be in trouble if you don't understand how this works. The sodium potassium pump is a, a means of primary active transport where we pump sodium and potassium against their concentration gradients so that we can keep this difference across the cell membranes. So I said that potassium was higher inside the cell and sodium is higher outside the cell. There are leak channels for both of these ions in all cells, which means that potassium is leaking out and sodium is leaking in. The reason that we do not establish chemical equilibrium is because of this sodium potassium pump. What it's going to do is it's going to bind three intracellular sodiums and pump them out against their concentration gradient. And it's going to change shape and then it's going to bind two extracellular potassiums and pump them back in against their concentration gradient. So this is going to be hugely important in setting what's called resting membrane potential. I'll talk about a little bit about it right now. We're going to talk a lot about it when we get to our neurons, but that's our brief review. Okay, so what this does is it sets up this concentration gradient. Well, now what we could do is I could put a symporter in here let's say, like a sodium iodide symporter or sodium glucose symporter. And what I can do is now I can move sodium down its concentration gradient and use that energy to move another substance with it against its concentration gradient. So it's active because I'm still moving something against its concentration gradient, but I'm not directly hydrolyzing ATP because I'm taking advantage of the concentration gradient that was established here. I'm not going to write that all down because if you really want to write it down, you can rewind. And again, this is just a review, <clears throat> but it's important to be aware of. What might not be a review is vesicular transport. And this is going to be super important when we start talking about all kinds of stuff. But neurons, again, are going to be releasing uh, their neurotransmitters by exocytosis. So if you don't know what exocytosis is, you're in trouble. So let's learn what our different types of vesicular transport is because a lot of gen bio classes don't cover this. So let's get it all up to speed. Endo means within. Cyto means cell. Osis is movement. So endocytosis is within the cell movement. How I'm going to bring something inside the cell. So endocytosis brings materials into the cell. What do I mean by vesicular transport? In a membrane-bound vesicle. So it's a vesicle because it's membrane-bound. And that membrane is going to be made of the same stuff as our cell membrane. So this is my little membrane-bound vesicle. 
And if I form one to bring stuff into the cell, I'm doing endocytosis. So then usually what you'll see is we call that an endosome, and the endosome will fuse with some lysosome inside the cell. So here's my little endosome, and then here's my lysosome, and the two get together and form an endolysosome. And then I break down whatever I don't need, and I can release it by exocytosis, we'll talk about it in a minute. And I can um, recycle some parts and put it back up at the plasma membrane. There's, so all of that stuff that's going on through the cell or within the cell or across the cell is transcytosis, trans across cell movement. So this is across cytocell and this is movement. Okay, I'm going to talk specifically about three types of endocytosis. So endocytosis is how we're going to use a membrane-bound vesicle to bring something into the cell. Phagocytosis, this word root phage here, refers to eat. So this is how my cell is going to eat. It's eating cell movement. And so this would be like if a cell is going to bring in a large particle, even up to as big as a cell, it can reach these like feet out and grab onto it and then bring those feet together and pinch off this endosome. So phagocytosis is endocytosis that's going to bring in large substances up to as large as a cell. So macrophages are some of those cells that can fight disease. They're macro, large, phages, eaters. They're big eaters. And what they do is they can ingest infected cells, virus uh, infected cells, bacterial cells. So really big particles. They reach out their plasma membrane. So like if this is their normal plasma membrane, they like reach out extensions of it and grab onto the cell and pinch it off and bring it in. That's phagocytosis. So phagocytosis is the endocytosis that is going to bring in large substances. The next kind of endocytosis we have is pinocytosis. This is often called cell sipping or cell drinking and that's because what happens here is the cell is just gonna like bring in little tiny droplets, droplets of extracellular fluid and whatever is suspended in it. So what you would see at the plasma membrane is you would see all these little pinocytotic vesicles forming. So you'd see like several of them like lining up at the plasma membrane and what's gonna happen is they're gonna pinch off and just bring in little droplets of extracellular fluid and whatever's in it. So we could say this brings in droplets of ECF or extracellular fluid and the suspended solutes. Our last type of endocytosis is called receptor mediated endocytosis. And what happens in receptor mediated endocytosis is you have a cell that has a bunch of receptors that are bound. So you're having a lot of reactivity and we don't want to respond anymore. So what we can do is bring in the plasma membrane that has all of those bound receptors and shut off our response. So you'll often see that like if a, if a cell is being bombarded by a hormone or something, then it can take in its receptors so that it doesn't have to respond. So receptor mediated endocytosis will say that the cell brings in the plasma membrane and all of its bound receptors. Cell brings in um, portions of the plasma membrane with bound receptors. So if I were going to draw a silly picture of this, what would it look like? Well, here's my cell, let's say, and let's say it's being bombarded with some hormone and so all of its receptors are bound. These look like these cell receptors. Ignore that. So all of our receptors are bound and so I'm having a lot of responsivity and I just don't want to. What I can do is pinch all of this in. So what does that look like? It would be like here are all those bound receptors. 
and then I just pinch that off and bring them all in and now I don't have to respond anymore. Pretty cool. It's all pretty cool. Okay. So, membrane potential. Oh. Okay, so how do I get things out of the cell in a membrane-bound vesicle? That happens through exocytosis. Exo, without cytocellosis movement. So in exocytosis, I am packaging a material into a vesicle that is going to fuse with the plasma membrane and release that material to the extracellular fluid. So package material into a vesicle that fuses with the plasma membrane and releases contents to the exterior. So what does that look like? Well, way back in the day when you were talking about the nucleus and the rough ER, we said that the rough ER had ribosomes. What do ribosomes do? They synthesize proteins. The rough ER synthesizes proteins that are destined for export from the cell. So what you'll see is that if there's something that's destined for export from the cell, it'll get packaged there. It gets, well, it gets produced in the rough ER. It gets packaged and processed in the Golgi. And then now this membrane bound vesicle with this stuff that I'm secreting is going to approach the surface of the cell. And since it's a membrane bound vesicle and made with the same stuff, it'll come right up to it and fuse with it. And then it can just dump all of the contents to the outside. So this is how our neurotransmitters are going to release uh, from our neurons is by exocytosis. So and like how some of our glands work and things like that. So it's important to be uh, aware of how we can get things out of a cell. All right, now membrane transport. We I briefly talk about this because, um, sorry. All right, now membrane potential. I briefly talk about this because it's going to be important when we get to neurons. All of our cells have a resting membrane potential. This is an electrical potential that's produced when we separate our oppositely charged particles across the plasma membrane. So all cells have a resting membrane potential. And what we're separating is positive from negative charges. And you say, yeah, but positive, potassium is positive and sodium is positive, so what are you talking about separating oppositely charged particles? Well, potassium is exiting the cell and there are these negatively charged proteins that are stuck inside the cell, so the cell feels a little negative, which is going to draw potassium back to the cell and is going to draw sodium to the cell, So, because they're electrically drawn in that way. So the potential that we get is this difference like in potential energy. It's energy that can be used to do something and it can be used to move stuff. So we'll see that. So this difference in charge that we see between two points is called a voltage. And any cell that has a charge is said to be polarized. Why? Because we've got, we create a pole and we've got a lot of charge on one side, a lot of uh, different charge on the other side. So in general, we could say that the body is chemically or and electrically neutral, but right at the cell membrane it's not. So if you look at the inside of the cell and most extracellular fluid, it's electrically neutral, but right at the plasma membrane, we can measure this membrane potential. So resting membrane potential is going to be determined by the movement of potassium and sodium. The only other ion that is kind of going to have any effect or going to be moving is chloride ion, but it's balanced chemically um, and electrically, so there's no like net effect on the change in resting membrane potential. So all of our ions are moving according to two gradients, a chemical gradient and an electrical gradient. So at first we're going to diffuse down our chemical gradient from high concentration to low concentration, but at some point the charges are going to repel each other and so at that point that's when um, uh, the you see the um, shift or the closing of our channels. So uh, 
far as resting membrane potential goes, potassium is the most important for setting resting membrane potential. And potassium is exiting the cell. So here are cells, and potassium is higher inside the cell, and sodium is higher outside the cell. So when potassium is moving through its leak channels, it leaks outside the cell, and it wants to pull the resting membrane potential to its electrical, to its equilibrium potential, which is negative 90 millivolts. So potassium wants to exit the cell until negative 90 millivolts. That's its equilibrium potential when our chemical and electrical forces are at equilibrium. Okay. Sodium wants to enter the cell. It's drawn to this negative charge that we can feel here. And we feel this negative charge due to these proteins that can't leave the cell. So it feels negative right there at the surface of the cell. So sodium is drawn to that. And sodium wants to enter the cell and bring it to positive 30, its equilibrium potential. Okay, so its equilibrium potential is positive 30, and sodium wants to enter the cell until then. Chloride ion is balanced. Its uh, chemical and equilibrium, or chemical and electrical potentials are balanced, so its movement doesn't have an effect on resting membrane potential. So we'll just say this has no effect on resting membrane potential. Chloride ion hangs out with potassium ion, so it's in higher concentration out here, outside the cell. Okay, and the only other thing that's going to be involved then is a sodium-potassium pump. So every cell has a different resting membrane potential, and the resting membrane potential of each cell is determined primarily by the number of potassium channels that are present. So we'll see in skeletal muscle cells, we have way more potassium channels, so their resting membrane potential is negative 90. In neurons, we stick some sodium channels in, and sodium comes into the cell then. So instead of being negative 90, since uh, potassium is exiting and trying to pull us to negative 90, if we've got positive charge coming in, it pulls our neurons to negative 70. So we'll look at this more when we move to neurons, but just be aware of that, that all of our cells have a resting membrane potential, and it's the movement of these ions in particular that's going to uh, control it. Primarily potassium, uh, it's the ion that has the biggest effect. So is that it? Oh, no. Okay. All right, so the cytoplasm is the juice that holds the stuff. Uh, so no, that's the, it's the fluid inside the cell. It's the intracellular fluid that is holding all of our organelles. And the composition of the cytoplasm uh, varies from cell to cell. So this is our intracellular fluid. And it suspends our organelles. Okay, cell division. Oh my goodness, I only very, very, very minimally want to talk about cell division. And why do I want to talk about it at all? Well, we'll see that some of our tissues are amitotic, meaning that they no longer undergo mitosis. Some of our tissues are highly mitotic, meaning that they do undergo mitosis. What is mitosis? It's the cell division that produces identical daughter cells, right? So where we have a parent cell that replicates all of its stuff and its DNA and splits into two identical daughter cells, right? So mitosis. This is the cell division that's going to be used by diploid cells, meaning that they've got two uh, copies of their whole chromosome content. And it's going to produce diploid cells that should be identical to each other and the parent they came from. So this is used by our somatic cells, our body cells, not our cells of reproduction. And this is the division of diploid, meaning that they've got two copies of the total number of chromosomes, one copy from the mom, one copy from the dad. 
So it's a division of our diploid cells and it produces identical daughter cells, ideally that are identical to each other and identical to the parent. All right, meiosis is super cool because in meiosis one, you have crossing over of this genetic information of maternal and paternal content so that you can have offspring that are unique from each other and from the parents. So what happens in meiosis one is you have the crossing over events so that we get unique combinations of these chromosomes. And then in meiosis two, you split it all apart. So now we have four haploid cells and they are unique from each other and unique from the parent. Pretty cool. So meiosis is used in sex cells or our gametes which are the oocytes and sperm. And what this is, is it's going to, we'll say it reduces the chromosome content to half. And produces daughter cells that are unique from the parent and each other. Produces haploid or one and daughter cells unique from the parent cell and each other. Fantastic stuff, meiosis, let me tell ya. All right, then the last thing to be aware of, when a cell is no longer good, <laughs> when it is aged or is bad for the system or no longer doing its job, it just kills itself. It's pretty awesome. And the system called apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Uh, it causes certain cells like cancerous cells or in, um, to just shrivel up and die, infected cells, old cells, to neatly self-destruct. So what's nice about that then is they can no longer harm the system. So there's all kinds of conversations that can be had out of that, but we're not gonna do it here. So the process begins with uh, leaking out all these chemicals that are gonna activate enzymes that are called capsaices. They're gonna degrade your DNA and degrade the cell structure, which is gonna lead to cell death. The dead cell is gonna shrivel up and die. It gets phagocytized then by macrophages. So they will gobble up that shriveled up dead cell and we'll be done with it.